Great. So let's start because we have a packed agenda. Um, but though, would you like to go to the next slide, please? So, as I say, we have a packed agenda trying to discuss whether digital technology really can make a difference. And we have, uh, in addition to myself, three really great speakers. Uh, Emilio from CGAP will give CGAP's perspective on this. They've done a lot of work recently uh, as part of their strategy preparation, and he's got some great insights. Puneet Chopra uh, will then discuss MSC's work with the government of India on the agri stack and digital farmer services uh, system, which is mind blowing in its, uh, its scope, scale and ambition. And then uh, Christina will talk about the four uh, lenses that we're applying to the Climate Resilient Agriculture Working Group's uh, white paper, which I will introduce uh, briefly uh, before she discusses those four lenses. So with that, let me hand over to Emilio. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, what I'd like to share is, is a little bit of a zoom out, um, trying to frame the challenge uh, to achieve a climate resilient agriculture, which is the topic of interest today. Uh, where I will go a little bit on the on the notion that uh, smallholders and other actors in the agricultural value chains are really facing what I call a double whammy, right? Not only is there an increasingly more frequently climate shocks that are affecting them, but uh, that is happening in the context of a worsening food insecurity crisis. So um, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of why we think this is this is relevant um, for this discussion. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the, the smallholder families are, are back in focus in the global development agenda for very good reasons, right? They, they are a very large population segment that has been one of the worst hit by climate change. And this is particularly true for women in these families, right? On the other hand, we know that climate change is erupting food systems in general where these smallholders play a crucial role. Um, but it's not only on production, but the disruption is really happening across all the different uh, value chain uh, 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 segments, right? Uh, in marketing, in processing, and, and overall food delivery. However, the ones that are hardly hit, like we mentioned, are the smallholders who are responsible for 40% of global food production, right? Sorry, uh, next slide. Now, now we can go to the next one. So the idea here is um, that you know we know of the relevance of, of the smallholder segment, um, and we know we want to make them more resilient for climate change. Right? Uh, as we start trying to address this issue, um, we are recognizing that uh, the challenge is compounded by a parallel need, a uh, very urgent need of feeding a growing population. And we are starting to realize that understanding the climate food security nexus is really at the core of us clarifying, you know, what, what are we really seeking when we say we want to transform smallholder agriculture and what is really the truly important outcome of this, right, so that we can tailor our strategies towards it. So the first, to start framing this, you know, I, I like to say around uh, the, the, the initial um, aspect that I'd like to highlight is that climate change is happening at the same time that a growing global food demand is happening. Uh, we have a rising population that it really is expected to accelerate and it's not going to peak until 2086 uh, according to uh, estimates. But if you look uh, and start segmenting the world, you see that the fastest growth in population is happening in low income countries and it's lowest, slowest in high income countries. So this is putting a lot of pressure on food system that are feeding low income countries and, and relatively lower pressure on food systems that are feeding the high income countries. Now, why is this important? This is important because it really is driving the investments that the, the big players in the, in the private and public sector are doing in food systems. Um, 
first, it's important to recognize that food systems are, are, are not homogeneous. They're very different and they organize different to feed different parts of the world. Um, throughout all of these food systems globally are facing a, a very uh, marked period of increased input costs yeah. that is affecting them throughout. And this rising input cost is mainly driven by conflict, right? Uh, we're talking about rising petrol that affects all production systems in agriculture, but this is also related to um, the, the war in Ukraine and regional conflict and geopolitical conflict, right? That's the reality of, of, of what's what's affecting uh, big investors in, in agriculture. Um, now, those food systems that are feeding the high income people of the world are investing significantly to address the challenge uh, of feeding a global population and um, making them more, making the food system more resilient to climate change and actually mitigate climate change, right? Now, the reality is that those food systems that are feeding low-income people across the world are not making those investments. So the results of that is that we're dealing with food systems with very different response capacity, right? Those thriving food systems um, where, where, you know, uh, that are profitable and are feeding the high-income people of the world, um, propose a tremendous opportunity to benefit smallholders throughout because there's a, there's there's a there's a lot of linkages through global trade but the reality is that this um food system leave most smallholders out right there 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 are very important barriers that would need to be overcome for more smallholders to participate and then there's also the, the recognition that for the other food systems that are struggling um they are finding it increasingly difficult to meet food demand, right, for uh, low income, uh, the low income population. And this is where most of the world's smallholders uh, participate. And they're becoming more and more um, vulnerable to shocks, especially climatic ones. So this is already happening, we realize, and there's an immediate effect that is already pretty evident, which is uh, of this double whammy that I, double whammy that I'm describing on smallholders, and that's um, food security, uh, food insecurity crisis. Right, we already see that vulnerable food systems affected by climate change and outpaced by local food demand are already failing in 48 countries. Right, and the risk is that. Uh, these hot spots, these red spots that you see where 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 the, the 48 countries lies, the risk is that it increases, right? It becomes bigger um, with worsening climate. And there's, you know, we can see that this is actually happening. The number, the estimate number of food insecure people in 2023 was 345 million. This is actually more than double than it was just three years ago in 2020. So this is important. This fuels a lot of further conflict and political unrest. That's why food security is at the top of the development agenda. Um, but it really is uh, a core part of explaining um, what uh, digital finance can do to support smallholders and transform agriculture. So there are two main uh, uh, intermediate kind of uh, goals that we want. Uh, we want to facilitate climate resilience for sure we need to facilitate greater productivity to meet a growing food demand at the same time, right? And the ultimate outcome, given, given the, the immediate effect of, of not addressing this is, is to be able to promote more sustainable food security. So what are the potential pathways to get there? Um, we start hypothesizing and phrasing this, and clearly there's, an, there's, there's a need for efforts uh, to ensure that more smallholders participate in those thriving food systems that do offer, can offer a lot of, of benefit in terms of becoming more resilient, more productive, uh, more food secure, and, and overall well-being, right? Yet this is a partial solution because um, by the nature of how food systems are organized, this will leave out a big share of smallholders and other consumers in low-income countries. So we also need to invest in act-taking innovations for those food systems that are feeding the rapidly growing low-income population and to where more, more, the most, most of smallholders currently participate. Right? Now, the type of investments and the type of innovations that financial flows 
should facilitate are those active innovations that do both. They uh, really allow for uh, mitigating climate change, building resilience against my, climate change, but they also increase productivity and lower cost to address the, the global food demand, right? Uh, there's already, if you go back up uh, just uh, to, to the previous one, so the, 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 the thing is that there's a lot of flows on this type of active innovations, but of course, this, this is really led by uh, private and public investments of, to apply to problems of the, let's say, higher income world, right? The, the, those food systems that, are, that have the means to, to make those investments. Uh, it's not necessarily happening for the lower income uh, world and the food systems that operate there. So there's a lot of adaptation um, to those low income contexts as there's a lot of evidence that active innovation will just not necessarily work, but just replicating. Right? So that's that's an important area of work. If you go to next step. Now, the questions that, that concerns us in the financial inclusion community is, you know, how can digital finance contribute to these pathways? And this is where uh, uh, we, we're, 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 we're very eager to have a, a, a debate with, with the financial inclusion community on how best to do that. We know we're starting, I think we're starting with a very good base where we know how to build uh, inclusive digital finance ecosystems, right? We know the building blocks that are needed, the payment system backbone, you need far reaching key core networks, you need ID systems, customer centric products, and all the enabling policies and regulations. This is stuff that we've been working for over a decade, right? Um, now, the current efforts that are really taking all of these systems to be viably operating rural areas are still going to be a prerequisite for any digital solution to be uh, applicable to this crowd of smallholders and, and all the agri SMEs that work with them. Um, but there are important knowledge gaps that uh, we, we feel we need to address. We, we need to know how to tailor this retail financial services, as well as public private mechanisms of blended finance to generate, adapt, and adopt those active innovations that bring most benefits to most smallholders in different contexts, right? Including um, low income context. And, and this is where CGAP is, is trying to um, shed some light and, and be able to identify how to focus. And I'm very happy to participate in this webinar because many of the examples that are shown next uh, reflect this type of tailoring and approaches are being tested. Thank you. Thanks, Emilo. Uh, over to you, Puneet. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, delighted to be here. Hi, everyone. So, uh, building what uh, Emilio just described, you know, the smallholder farmers at the bottom of the pyramid are uh, still untouched by the agri tech uh, innovations and other innovations uh, that are happening. And uh, most of these uh, innovations tend to be still don't have the scale or the reach uh, and are largely still uh, impacting only those at the uh, top of the pyramid or perhaps in the middle of the pyramid. And so I'll talk about Agri Stack in India, which is an attempt to try to solve for exactly these uh, problems. And the vision of uh, Agri Stack is, is, to create a, uh, is, is to create a solution which integrates you know, multiple stakeholders, uh, leveraging shared data, common services, complementary services, and creating a unique uh, value proposition, which can have a, a multiplier impact. And uh, what, what it is trying to solve for is, uh, you know, agri tech innovators that uh, typically tend to be a wall garden, uh, they're limited to the innovations that they have, they do not have the scale and the reach or the investments that uh, uh, Emilio described, you know, uh, are, are the barriers for, for them to uh, achieve scale. And uh, so Agri, Agri Stack in India is, is uh, an aspiration to uh, towards uh, uh, solving for that. And so essentially it is a framework of uh, you know, data sets, uh, APIs, reference architecture, and design uh, that uh, uh, can be eventually created as a digital public infrastructure using open standards and uh, open architecture. 
and in a, the the vision is that in a uh, study and mature state it will have offerings and services for uh, everyone in the agri ecosystem from uh, small world of farmers at the bottom of the pyramid to intermediaries market participants across the value chains uh, from upstream to downstream uh, government government and public institutions uh, research institutions and and so on uh, so it it's kind of addresses the needs of everyone in the in the ecosystem uh, next slide please so the, uh, the the fundamental approach of the agri stack is to uh, both use and build on existing uh, data sets services and and solutions leveraging them and then building uh, building further on them the at the core of it are three foundational data sets or uh, registers the first one of this is the farmers uh, database which uh, would have their uh, demographic profiles detailed demographic profile along with their land holdings and often they have fragmented land holdings so it will uh, bring all of them together so that they can be uh, cross connected with one another the second is a land register which will be geo referenced uh, data and and therefore and it will have the gps coordinates of these each individual land parcel and it will therefore lend itself to many uh, powerful use cases which can uh, which i'll describe and which uh, can then use the uh, gps coordinates and the georeferencing of these land parcels and then the third of the score uh, fundamental register is the crops uh, themselves that are grown on these land parcels uh, season over season in addition to these it will leverage many existing databases for, and uh, data sets for example there is a large fertilizer uh, database uh, of the uh, subsidy uh, on fertilizer the direct benefit transfer of fertilizers where every uh, farmer uh, accessing uh, or, or taking subsidy from that uh, scheme uh, is is captured along with the type of fertilizer they are using the quantum the frequency and so on uh, another very powerful database is uh, soil health the database which captures the the soil health and the state of the soil the the, the state of micronutrients within the soil for uh, nearly all the farmers uh, in india and of course there are accuracy challenges and and there is a need to fine tune that but it's a it's a very good starting point uh, another one is a crop insurance uh, database uh, which again captures a host of uh, farmer uh, related information to enable underwriting of uh, crop insurance and uh, including the large prime minister's crop insurance scheme in india but but also uh, other sort of uh, insurance schemes and there are other databases like the procurement database of uh, cereals and other produce that is uh, uh, that is sold by farmers through uh, government systems so there is a single uh, database that uh, captures that and together all of these will then lend to creation of multiple use cases uh, that that would be beneficial to the smallholder producers these are across agri advisory financial services whether it is credit insurance uh, others uh, market linkages on input side on on outputs on value addition and, and so on and then uh, the government programs itself so you know all of these use cases will span across government and private sector and uh, uh, uh you know uh, of, of be of great utility to uh, the smallholder farmers and this will be through a unified farmer services interface um which will enable easy and uh, seamless plug in of additional services so you know it will not be restricted to the initial service that are created but uh, the fundamental approach is that other service providers Uh, other innovations are able to connect to this use the power of this platform and the underlying uh, philosophy and design principles to be able to offer uh, their services while also leveraging the shared data and the share and the profiles with, which get enriched over a period of time you know so it will start and then uh, as the footprints get created those profiles will get enriched and lend themselves to use of uh, uh, multiple uh, additional use cases 
uh, for these uh, service providers. Uh, so, so that's sort of the uh, what's unique about this that it uh, it will leverage best of breed solutions uh, while leveraging common shared data and uh, 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 leveraging the footprints and demographics, and then continuing to build on those. Uh, next slide, please. And if we contrast and compare Agri Stack with with the uh, India Stack, you know, which is based on Aadhaar, many of you might know about it, uh, which has uh, which is extremely you know uh, well well known and and proven, and you know it has really transformed micro payments, uh, the payments for uh, you know digital financial services as well as payments for the excluded and other use cases in a big way. So Aadhaar or uh, uh, you know India Stack uh, broadly is a database of residents which is uh, with a unique aadhar id for each uh, resident uh, and agri stack would, would be a database of, of farmers fundamentally with a unique farmer id uh, india stack has the demographic information of all the residents similarly agri stack would have that for the for farmers but also uh, like i described you know their land uh, gps uh, uh, and uh, geofence uh, tagged information of the land, crops, and then uh, the footprints of uh, the transactions, the uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, in, the the way they interact with the platform. So, you know, data points that get captured and then this profile will continue to get built. And in terms of the interfaces, uh, the whole approach is that there is a very simplified, seamless uh, interface, which lends uh, uh, additional service providers to connect and disconnect uh, very uh, easily and seamlessly uh, without kind of creating complex one-to-one -one integrations, uh, you know, which just don't uh, allow scalability and uh, sort of open systems and open architecture. So in uh, India stack, it is the unified payments interface. Here it is the unified farmer service interface and then sort of a suitable uh, regulator. So uh, moving on, uh, you know, India uh, uh, Agri Stack is 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 a, a reference framework. And if you were to, uh, if you could move on to the next slide, uh, the uh, translating that into action in terms of the actual real platform that is being developed. And while Agri Stack as a framework and uh, reference uh, uh, architecture would evolve, the integrated farm digital farmer services platform is uh, being developed in in one of the states in India. Uh, which you know sort of build, build, borrows on and builds on these uh, fundamental uh, principles, but uh, and also you know uh, it will give an opportunity to uh, to test and learn. And uh, uh, as it as it uh, matures, it will uh, have an opportunity to become a reference design and solution for other states and and for uh, uh, scaling up across uh, India and, uh, and potentially other geographies. The way, uh, for example, the India stack is now uh, and and uh, digital ID kind of solutions are being replicated in many geographies. And uh, in terms of some of the uh, design principles, uh, the the approach is to try to address you know barriers of digital and financial literacy, the lack of penetration of uh, smartphones and internet, and inability of many of the smallholder farmers to really leverage them. To avail uh, the agri uh, tech innovations and, and other uh, sort of uh, needed services for them, and uh, this will be through uh, an approach of uh, a hybrid approach of uh, physical and digital. We know that you know it, it cannot be all digital from day one, so there will be enablement of intermediaries, uh, extension workers, and others who will uh, be partially or fully, uh, digitally enabled and and uh, be able to then offer uh, services. Uh, as an intermediate step till farmers gradually start becoming more uh, digitally ready. And other innovations in, in technology, for example, speech to text, speech recognition, of course, AI, ML, and uh, uh, innovations such as uh, you know, the, the lack of penetration of smartphones would be addressed through uh, some solutions, although not uh, you know, at, at full, uh, uh, wouldn't have the full power of smartphone based solutions but limited offerings that uh, some of the smallholder farmers can also use feature phones to avail services and uh, we envisage about uh, more than 15 service providers in the in the next uh, uh, 2 to 3 years uh, to to be able to connect uh, with this platform and, and offer 
uh, this their their services uh, and and uh, you know, uh, this entire kind of ecosystem and then lend themselves for uh, for scaling and, and and adding of additional service providers including you know government's uh, services private sector agri innovators and so on and uh, so overall we do see that this uh, has a great potential to enable diffusion of innovations at scale and and overcome some of the barriers that we started with I'll stop here and happy to take questions uh, later on in this uh, uh, in this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Puneet. Um, so it falls to me to introduce uh, the uh, climate responsive agricultural white paper, um, which reflects some of these issues. Um, so we know agriculture, particularly in Africa is in bad shape. Um, MSC has just completed work with CGAP to look at uh, Bangladesh and um, Nigeria and did some work also in India. And uh, it scared the living daylights out of me. For the last decade, there has been a relentless erosion of small farmer um, income and asset base uh, in, in a way that I've never in my career uh, seen before. Next, please. And we've got to a stage where incremental changes are simply not going to be enough. We need a full transformation of agri-food agri systems uh, across Africa, Asia, and indeed Latin America. And, and we know that this is possible. We have seen it in select countries in all of these geographies. So the question becomes, how can we accelerate the transformation of agri-food systems. And we have a, a conundrum here because we have the knowledge, we have the tools, but we don't seem to have very much action. We know that small, small uh, holder agriculture can be competitive. We know much about the constraints that uh, you know, uh, small holder farmers have faced over the years. We even know how some of those constraints can be overcome and, um, and have examples of where they have been overcome. And many of the core technologies um, to adapt to climate change are already available. Particularly in the context of the CIFAR Alliance, digital technology already promises opportunities to radically improve smallholder farmer um, agriculture and address many of those constraints. So again, a, 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 a question, why are we not seeing more rapid adop, uh, adoption of, of these uh, technologies? And, and perhaps is climate change as well as being a real crisis, also an opportunity to catalyze transformation? So the CIFAR working group uh, comprising the, the institutions you see below um, is designed to build on and complement the work of its members. And we're focusing on three interrelated pillars. The integration and coordination of value chains, something that the agri-stack that Ponita has just described is also attempting to do. The diffusion of innovations across all value chain participants and the financing of, uh, of uh, innovation uh, on an end-to-end -end basis. So let me unpack each of those one by one. When we talk about the integration uh, along value chains, very often this is, uh, as Puneet has highlighted, using platforms. We Small and, 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 and diversified um, farming systems can indeed be more resilient and more productive but they need the resources, the information, and the capacity to link smallholder farmers with the businesses along the value chain. Uh, but the market solutions currently available face challenges with communication um, and technology, with weak infrastructure, and ineffective formal institutions to provide the governance and the rules of the game. So, what this means is that for, to affect real transformation, um, we need to uh, address multiple elements of these challenges simultaneously. 
And while digital platforms in principle could provide the solutions we need for this integration and coordination, we actually have seen very few successful examples. And it is actually really important that we dissect and understand what makes uh, the success stories, um, you know, useful business models that we might uh, replicate and pursue. However, many of the uh, success stories um, are derived from different types of markets and socioeconomic environments. And so while we can learn from them, we will need to tailor them. The second pillar is the diffusion of innovations. And this, for, for me, is, a, is a, an extraordinary challenge that I think has been under addressed. We have become very uh, interested in and attracted to developing new digital solutions, new innovations that have the potential. But rarely do we look hard enough at how to drive their uptake and usage. And as a consequence, if you look at Africa, for example, for digital uh, innovations, just 13% uh, have any uptake, oh, sorry, 13% of farmers have uptake of digital solutions, and only 5% of them actually use those digital technologies. So while we've got the proliferation of digital technology, um, and, and that digital technology covers almost all aspects of agri-food systems, there is a but. And the but is that we've not paid enough attention on how these innovations diffuse across the value chains. So what are the problems? Well, the, the problems are, are influenced by a, a range of sociocultural issues, um, some of the sort of mental models and frameworks that, that uh, uh, poorer people use uh, to assess innovation and opportunity, and also their values uh, and the, their perceptions of risk and therefore their trust in these digital technologies. And those of you who've been involved in um, digital financial services will recognize these problems because we face similar problems in the diffusion of, of digital financial services. And I think there are a couple of really important areas that are worth flagging in this context. First of all, as Emilio pointed out earlier, women are disproportionately affected by climate change, typically um, have uh, smaller holdings and therefore less opportunity. Um, but also, um, they uh, are, are very often the wrong side of the, of the digital gender divide. And, and so, that is one issue that we need to pay a lot of attention to. The second that is very often uh, not recognized is the oral community. In these poorer, more vulnerable, more remote communities, many people are still illiterate and innumerate and therefore struggle with the traditional interfaces of uh, these solutions. The, the third and final key aspect that I think is important is youth, because youth has the potential to catalyze change. Um, and we've seen from our work in the field that there is a growing, uh, slow but growing tendency for youth to see agriculture as being sexy again, interesting, because it is digitally driven and enabled. So we need to, I think, leverage youth better than we've done to date. And in that context, the MasterCard Foundation's approaches, I think, have high potential. So ultimately, if we're going to address the challenges of diffusion of innovation, we have to look carefully at the interface between the physical and the digital, because pure digital is not going to work. We need to be very clear about that. And also the informal and the formal. The third pillar is uh, financing that transformation and looking beyond traditional uh, instruments. Smallholder farmers, as with other poor people, need a range of financial services. And financing transformation is going to require coordinated investments, both within firms and farms, but also between uh, firms and farms along value chains. Um, and 
as a consequence, sort of traditional piecemeal financial products are not going to be adequate. We need a more comprehensive suite. Now, there are already many areas of promise amongst digital financial solutions, most obviously embedded finance and also some of the PAYGO systems that are used to finance asset acquisition. But I, I worry that pure market-based solutions will not be sufficient. There, the constraints in terms of the long-term financing required for transformation, the high risk associated with lending into the agriculture sector or indeed providing insurance services, particularly in the context of the covariant risk, which is amplified by climate change, means that uh, basic uh, let the private sector or the market take care of it approaches will not work. The good news is that there's a huge opportunity to leverage green finance, whether that's carbon credits or uh, climate or nature-based funding um, from the international community, we need to look at deploying these funds alongside um, the, the traditional financial services approaches. And this means that we have four uh, sectors um, of finance that we will need to depend on. Next, please. That is, the traditional financial services system complemented by the digital financial services of embedded finance, PAYGO, et cetera, et cetera, the existing informal and community-based finance systems and those state and international uh, finance funds that will be needed to drive transformation and thus uh, a climate adaptation. Next, please. So we believe that the, the CRAG Working Group has the potential to catalyze change. All of our members are implementing a range of projects. And if we enable collaboration across that diverse range of actors and projects, we can pursue a shared learning agenda addressing these three pillars that are so important. So we would love others who share this vision to join us. And as we move forward, addressing these three pillars of uh, integration and coordination of value chains, diffusion of in innovations and financing transformation, we will uh, look at it through four cross-cutting themes. And that is what Christina will now talk about. Thanks, Graham. It's my pleasure to talk about the four cross-cutting themes for, for the working group. Um, the, the first is localization. And as, as we've been hearing, the solutions really need to be locally customized. Um, but not only that, they, they need to build local capacity, local institutions, local resources, assets, et cetera. And so we must carry out this work in a way collectively that builds that local capacity um, that transfers and reallocates the power from, um, from the global north and from the top down into these uh, local communities and, and institutions um, and, and supporting locally led innovation, locally led diffusion of innovation um, to, to support that, that uptake. Um, and that's something that's 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 really critical here and something that will take collective effort from the working group to support that that localization process um, over over time. And just as one statistic that that sticks in my mind um, and, 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 and really, um, uh, yeah, I, I really can't get beyond is 78% um, of the climate finance that is going to Africa is actually going to institutions based outside of Africa. And so there's there's really a paradigm shift um, that that we need to change here. And that's something that we can advocate for um, and, and also live and embody through our, our collective and individual work. The second is the issue of, of measurement and measurement of, of impact and, and how are we building resilience. And that's a 
that's a very hot topic. It's one of the things I'm I'm here in in Bonn, Germany, at the climate change intersessional climate change negotiations, um, that is working on the the global goal on adaptation and and trying to define what what that is and substantiate that further. Thankfully, this working group doesn't need to get 190 countries to agree to a definition, but by building a collective um, framework for monitoring impact uh, over time, we, we develop and have the ability to test and learn across a much greater range of conditions and innovations um, and, and um, settings that will enable us to develop a more uh, robust framework that can in turn serve as a global public good for, for others entering the space to, to use as it gets refined and finalized, um, which I think is a, is a really important contribution and something that we can learn, that, that we can use um, to learn. Are we delivering the results we need to be and intend to be delivering in the most effective, efficient, and, and equitable ways um, possible? And that Kind of leads to the third pillar, um, which is about share information sharing and, and shared learning. Um, this is a diverse community of practice that we have here and a, a relatively new area of practice. And so there's there's a need for rapid and accelerated learning. And, and by bringing together um, people from different fields, from different and, and complementary areas of expertise, different networks, different um, expertise and experiences to share, it really allows us to draw on that collective body of learning to, to exchange, to identify opportunities, um, to identify common challenges um, and, and, and common solutions um, from, from each other's work. And so I think that's a, that's a really valuable um, contribution. And then last but not least, there's the need for collective advocacy. Um, and, and with a collective voice, we can amplify uh, each other's messages uh, and reach greater audiences, raising awareness of, of the opportunities with digital technology for climate resilient agriculture, but also the need for, for the investment um, that, that we've just heard about um, and how that investment needs to be deployed. Um, at a much larger scale to to and and in a much more connected and integrated way to 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 catalyze the transformation that uh, I think we all want to see. Um, so I'll I'll leave it there, but hopefully I've I've uh, expressed uh, some of the benefits um, and areas of focus of engaging in this working group, and we're certainly um, uh, open and and uh, uh, eager to have greater engagement. Graham, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Christina, and thank you for taking your time out of uh, out of hand-to-hand uh, -hand negotiation in Bonn. I really appreciate it very much. Um, Good description. <laughs> so um, with that, um, I'm very proud because it's one of the first webinars I've been on for a while that actually has left time for questions from the audience. And um, so I'd like to open it up to uh, those who patiently listen to us um, and hear from you uh, if you have any questions. Please raise your hand and I'm sure um, we will do our best to respond. And Graham, you've got two, two questions already in chat. Um, one from Tofene, um, apologies for pronunciation, around um, awareness of any tech or digital solutions that have helping to scale centropic agriculture um, applications and initiatives. And then I think we've got one from David Del Cerf around um, localization and how um, programs like TECA, which is another CIFAR Alliance initiative, might you know, be a supporting partner or integrated within CRAG to help accelerate some of those, uh, some of those efforts to localization that, that you and, and Christina and others have just talked about. So two, two questions from chat. Great. I, 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 I saw the question um, uh, from Tefone, and um, I have to confess that I am unaware um, of, of uh, any other examples of that outside Brazil. Um, but but uh, we, can, we can certainly be looking for that. Um, and I think that raises an interesting point, which, of course, is that um, while this working group um, is largely focused on the three pillars, there are, of course, you know, um, 
other uh, types of technologies that are you know growing and that we are not as focused on and and obviously biotech is one of them and and some of these uh, growing techniques are, are, are others um so uh, with regards to david uh, i'd like actually to um ask uh, both Ponit and Christina um, to comment on that a little bit. Um, the Tekka Fund, David, David, perhaps you just talk very briefly about the Tekka Fund so that uh, Ponit and Christina have a chance to respond uh, directly to you. Of course. Uh, thanks, guys, for a great webinar. This is very, very good. Um, so very briefly, because this is not the day to talk in depth about Tekka, but what we do We've done already once, at least in Tekka, and we have some great exponents of that in the call, is we convene local innovators who want to launch a startup. They don't yet know exactly what it looks like. They don't have an idea completely figured out. They don't have a co-founder. That's okay. We The program supplies that, right? We, we convene 30, 40, last time it was 30 fellows from different seven different African countries, half of them women, half of them men. And we tell them, look, there's money here. Just you, you guys form teams, come up with visions uh, for products that you'd like to build and pitch the community. And then we'll, we'll uh, our unfortunate resources are limited, but we'll get the, them where we think they can be the most impactful. And then you launch companies from the ground, building solutions for those communities. Um, you know, startups take a while to take off, but if you don't start today, you don't have them tomorrow when you really need them. Um, so I'm just curious as, as you've been thinking about the bigger picture and you, you mentioned the learning agenda, well, startups are a great way to learn. At the beginning, they're essentially a learning device, a learning vehicle. Doesn't feel like one to the entrepreneur, but that's what, in retrospect, that's what they are. Um, so I, I just, I'm just curious if that's something you think within this context would, would make sense or is as an alternative, a better way to learn to work with more established players, right? That's the alternative typically. So I, I, is, I, I'm sure there's not an and or, I'm just curious what you think or either. I'm happy to start, but I mean, I think that's a great example um, where you're actually building that local innovation capacity, the capacity to build the startup, to learn along the way, to tolerate the risk, um, to, to, to experiment, to innovate, to iterate on solutions. And, and that's that's exactly the sorts of capacities that that we need to be building. Um, you know, it, it's prob it may not, you know, flourish into the successful, you know, at scale company that um, in the first go, but that's that's fine. As you said, this is also about planning for the future and thinking ahead to the capacities that that we'll need um, to cope with ever changing, you know, ever numbers of mouths to feed as well as uh, ever changing climate um and so i think that's a that's a great example of how we're building that local capacity that in turn builds further capacity right as it as it as it goes on and i think that's that's a really um great example and a, an important point of how the global community can support that local innovation and that local um entrepreneur yeah, and and, uh, just sorry, adding the starting some thoughts uh, to it, uh, David. So certainly, uh, you know, uh, it is important that uh, local innovations are nurtured, and uh, we are seeing multiple ways in which it is kind of happening. So we are seeing a, of course, uh, there is a, a mushrooming of uh, local innovators in in many markets, and you know, uh, and uh, uh, the opportunities through uh, accelerator programs, and uh, also uh, you know, in for example, a program program connected to the one that I described. Uh, it's uh, it's essentially, uh, you know, uh, enabling a sandbox environment. So, you know, there's it's, it's kind of supported by this very specific one, uh, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and GIZ, where they invited many of these innovators to create a sandbox environment for an agree data information exchange. And uh, the, uh, the innovations that come out of that and some that have the potential of scale would be connected back into the agri stack platform so that then those who have the potential to scale are given that in uh, support of investment and uh, opportunity through this platform to to be able to then take it uh, far and wide you know so th those are some examples where we are seeing this uh, uh, so definitely very important and some of these could be kind of you know avenues for for it to happen 
Thank you for yeah. me. Great. So let's move on to a couple more questions. I just make the observation that Emilio's point about how a lot of innovation is not focused in the countries that need it most be because they're poorer and therefore um, less attractive in some respects. Um, that is another reason why I think focused assistance to grassroots startups becomes so important. Rahul Prakash, you are most welcome and please give your, give your question. But you'll have to unmute first. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Rahul Prakash. I'm founder of Amal Farm. So we work on geographical indication tag agri-based products across India. And we are uh, uh, working with marginal farmers and trying to experiment how this value chain could be tightly coupled with a you know, climate resilient model that can not only improve their income through direct selling of produce, but also work as an incentive when, when we in cash those carbon maybe after five or seven years, because this is a long process. You cannot immediately you know, trade a carbon and give it back to the farmers. It takes time, right? But to, to run the entire model operationally, you need to have a value chain, very strong value chain developed at the local level. Very, and that is what we are trying to do. So now my question to everyone is that, do we have any such successful models where this climate resilient and value chain is tightly coupled together at local level that helps farmer directly earn more income? That is a really good question, Raul. And um, we had this discussion on the uh, climate, re climate resilient agricultural virtual club, which is separate from the working group. Um, and in the context of India, for all the reasons you talked about, it's a real struggle because of you know the, the piecemeal nature of the carbon credits and also the, the time it takes for them to mature. I, I am aware that in Kenya, they believe that they're further along. And I'm wondering if there's anyone on the call who has um, experience with what's going on with carbon credits in agriculture in Kenya. David? Not enough to, an to answer credibly. <laughs> Sorry, Raul. Okay, so Raul, let me, let me um, talk around and, and, and see whether I can get an answer uh, on that, um, because it's a really valuable point. I mean, ultimately, you know, in, in my presentation, I blithely talked about carbon credits for smallholders, but as I say, the, the piecemeal and dispersed nature of for smallholder farmers makes that very difficult because they don't create the carbon credits in, in lumpy enough, wholesale enough form. Thanks so much for your question. Mm -hmm. Just to note on the, on the carbon credits, oh, um, great. there are, there are you, a couple um, blogs that have just recently been um, published um, by the CARFI uh, working group. I'm not sure if they address your question specifically, but they might address elements to it or, or offer clues to where you can go to get some more information on that. So we can, um, uh, if you want to land on the, the CFIRE Alliance LinkedIn page, uh, you can find them there. Um, we can also circulate in the follow-up to, to this conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Navrat. Yeah. Uh, uh, Graham, nice to meet you after a long time. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very important event. Thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, I I just repeat the word the Graham has mentioned that digitization is important, but you know, when we talk the smallholder farmers, a kind of you know the the kind of physical touch or personal touch is also needed because you know sometimes uh, sometimes they feel disconnected when we talk. We believe more on digitization thing, and then I think the. When we talk about this fourth theme, like um, uh, David and Christina has highlighted, I think we can, if we can work uh, around this theme for long term, like, you know, in the case, in, in our case, we have already encouraged farmers to go for agroforestry. So when we talk agroforestry, I think that is already, they are already, you know, in the path for, for, for climate 
adaptative, you know, kind of thing, you know, climate friendly agriculture. And we are encouraging them um, to adopt clean energy, you know, to shift to solar energy and hydro energy to cook, you know, and then the, to, to reduce their dependency on firewood. So that is another example. And then we, what we have a package that, you know, if they are, they are, they adopt, they, they adopt agroforestry and clean energy, then we have a kind of incentive, like, you know, to give a, you know, some insurance or, you know, to reduce a certain percent of loan. So they feel that, you know, I get this benefit because I am more sensitive to the climate. Uh, climate. So, so this kind of thing is, is needed to think, think big, you know, I mean, we, rather than doing a small thing here and there, if we can plan like, like I, 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 I pull out the, the attention of Punit, you know, like if we have a database, so where we can put all this information. So how uh, farmers is already, you know, more sensitive and then aware about climate things and, uh, you know, and their behavior are now more climate friendly and uh, in the net zero emission, those kind of data, if we can, we can, we can, we can, uh, you know, collect. And then, and then if some farmers, they are already contributing to reduce CO2, then if we have a mechanism, like could be, you know, some kind of insurance or some kind of technology, we can provide them incentive. So I think this climate thing is still how, what, you know, the when we talk, I have put a, a question on measurement thing also, you know, this is a very tricky thing, you know, how we will measure the, the climate credit, you know, you know, right. how the farmers can benefit. Those things are still not very clear, you know, and the technology, you know, farmers, how they can adopt new technology, all, all those things, I think. I think today we we the today today discussion raised a lot of concern on around those issues, so we need to really plan all those things. And in Nepal, we we I think we are far behind, and we we the farmers are not aware, and even we are not not very much educated on what is this climate thing, how we can go ahead, you know, and how how you know how how we'll be moving on coming few years or few days kind of thing. Yes. Yes. That's Thank you, Navraj. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, that's, I, I have one more question before I ask um, uh, the panelists for a final parting uh, sentence or thought. And this is from Akta uh, Hamed, uh, the CEO of Sajeda. Akta, did you want to uh, reveal yourself and ask the question direct? Welcome. Right. Yeah. Hi, Graham. How are you? Good. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I've been observing this uh, eco uh, for some time and seen uh, many interventions. But the, the as of my understanding, on the basis of the context of Bangladesh and the agro population, I think uh, we need to find out a mechanism uh, for them to earn. Uh, my question is, uh, can you run a research uh, on, are these farmers not getting enough from their crop when they're growing high yield crop, their production have gone up, now they can produce more uh, output from their small holding of land, but still they're poor, still not they're getting the right price. Is it the large corporate extortion on end product. And that's what they buy from the market. So their income is basically deplexing from this. They, they could save more, but they, they cannot because the crop they're producing, they have to purchase that crop when it is coming on a pack. How it is impacting their life? A. Number two, I have seen a couple of tryouts and one of the tryout was done by Solidariat. They created a village supermarket, but that is not, that has not clicked. And to my understanding, it didn't click because middlemen came in a very high velocity uh, with uh, creating a discomfort in the farmer's mind that their 
crop, if they bring it to village supermarket once, twice, and if they cannot sell, then the they middleman will not buy it. So how this ecosystem can we, can we break? And I think the uh, potential to give the farmer a better income lies there, uh, meaning the input they're purchasing at a very rational price and, and getting a little more from the crop they're growing. Yes, uh, loans, uh, insurance, all comes into this ecosystem with, uh, with, it, with its need. Digitization, you rightly said, Graham, they cannot read uh, and their feature phone cannot store uh, the required amount of SMS which we send. So once it is full, the next SMS does not reach into their smartphone. So what is the alternative? So let me ask Puneet to answer that because he's worked on exactly these problems and the e-chopals in, uh, um, in India. So Puneet, briefly, because we're now overrunning a bit. Sure. Uh, so uh, Atar, um... Uh, what, what I mean, you're you're very right, and uh, you know what we really find is that the uh, in the value chain, the, the the share of margins that really uh, gets to the small holder is it's much smaller, and majority of it is retained further down the value chain. And uh, really, in the small holder farmers are compelled to uh, even if it is high value crops, you know, they're compelled to sort of uh, dispose them off uh, at the farm gates, uh, and very few have limited. Uh, opportunity to add value or uh, to kind of uh, you know be able to process or or, or really uh, therefore kind of uh, add value there so uh, but what we find is at least uh, you know some silver lining through some of our programs through with the farmer producer organizations farmer collectives as as one uh, opportunity and also uh, you know involvement of these intermediaries in in value addition and then uh, retail uh, direct retail so you know if, if you come to uh, uh, some of the uh, eastern parts of india uh, you know bihar uh, orissa etc uh, we could you know uh, show you some of these models where uh, retail direct retail to consumers where the sourcing happens from uh, from farmers through a kind of aggregation through farmer collectives with some uh, sort of efficiency gains through digitization and so on. The, there has been an improvement in the margins, the, the overall value realization and so on. So uh, I think there are examples there, which of course not at scale, but, but have uh, sort of, you know, opportunity to, uh, as models that, that can potentially be scaled up. And very quickly, uh, responding to uh, Navraj, what, what you mentioned. So, uh, you know, uh, what we see is that, uh, you know, there are, there is uh, awareness about innovation. Many leading farmers, they are aware of good practices, climate resilient, regenerative agriculture practices and so on. But it's a lot about how they can be scaled up, how they can diffuse in the ecosystem. And that is where uh, we see the potential of some of the uh, digital solutions or platforms uh, that I talked about, which can, together with the the physical interface uh, enable you know diffusion of innovations, both from a supply side, but also in the ecosystem uh, itself in the local communities. Uh, I'll stop here. Great. Thanks so much, Puneet. Last comment from Emilio and uh, Christina, and then I think we'll have to wrap up. Well, I hope you'll forgive us, Pedro. Um, maybe, maybe just a final reflection on my end. I, I, I think there's there there's a lot of dynamism uh, in terms of experimentation of the type of digital innovations that can be applied to uh, transform smallholder agriculture. I think we, we, we need to keep on doing that, but we also need to kind of very quickly move into taking stock into what works and what doesn't. Um, and it's a natural process. I think this is something that um, this type of experimentation with a, with a new digital angle is, is new on the, in the agro space, in the smallholder space. Um, but uh, so, so we should kind of like um, be aware that we, we, we need to start very quickly moving into what are those specific act techs, specific financial solutions, what kind of public-private collaboration will be needed because this is not going to be a, a, a totally a private sector-led kind of uh, work. 
um, so that we can start getting a bit more concrete and, and being able to respond to many of the questions that have just been laid out from the public, right? Great. Thanks, Emilio. Christina? Sure, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, and I, I think it's a, a Chinese refrain that says, in crisis, there is opportunity. And I, I think as we you know, are already trying to tackle the productivity um, lapses that, that exist and, and hunger um, and livelihood insecurity, and then add on top of that potential droughts, more rainfall variability, fires, heat, extreme heat, we, within all of that, it can seem very, very desperate. But what I see within this community is is opportunity to to really drive a, a wedge in and try and experiment with new approaches, bundled approaches, digital and non digital um, uh, approaches that are that are coupled together, more integrated, connected to finance. Um, et cetera, that, that I think truly has the power to be more transformational. So I think um, that there's a lot of problems to solve, but I think within this broad sphere of multiple crises, of poly crises, we, we do have um, an important opportunity um, and, and responsibility to, to seize it, I think. I'll stop there. Great. That is a wonderful sentiment on which to end. And uh, let me thank my co-speakers really appreciate all the effort you put in. I'll let uh, Christina go back to her hand-to-hand -hand negotiation and all the best with that. And uh, thank everyone else for attending. Really appreciate it. And thank you to David and Jesse and Nelly and all involved in the CFAR Alliance. This is a really important initiative and uh, I can't thank them enough for having taken it. With that, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>